NASCAR Coast to Coast here on the Motor Racing Network. I'm Hannah Newhouse, joined each and every week by my co-host, Kyle Ricky And Kyle, the last episode here of 2021. We've made it through yet another season for four years. You and I have been doing this, which is crazy to think about. Uh, and, and it all kind of came down for the race or for the series that we're here Coastal, you know, in the United States, that came down to this last weekend at Phoenix, where the ARCA West was able to crown a champion at the Arizona Lottery 100. Man, it was high stakes going into it. First off, let me say this year went by so much quicker than last year when we had all of the <laughs> COVID issues and we had a lot of shows where it wasn't a whole lot to talk about because all the short tracks were either not open yet or shut down. And uh, two, yeah, a, a wild race to wrap up our fourth season together here on NASCAR Coast to Coast at the Phoenix Raceway, the NASCAR Can and Pro Series West. You'll never guess who won. Uh, Ty Gibbs led all 100 laps en route to yet another win this season over Tanner Gray, Sammy Smith, Nick Sanchez, and J.P. Bergeron. But it was the battle outside of the top 10 that really shook things up over the final mile of the race uh, with Jesse Love finishing 14th, Trevor Huddleston finishing 15th, but that's not how they took the white flag. Yeah, no, that's not how they took the white flag because it came down to one position that uh, Jesse Love needed. And ironically enough, it was over Jake Drew's teammate of Trevor Huddleston that would be the deciding factor between uh, a championship and a runner up place for Jesse Love. And we'll actually talk to Jesse, who was went on to be crowned your 2021 ARCA West Series champion, back to back championships for Jesse Love. He won it last year being the youngest ever crowned champion at just 15 years old. And Kyle, now he's 16 and a two-time champion. Uh, that is that is unfathomable in some in some sense. At least he's eligible now for a, a yeah. national series ride if, if one tour to come open because it wasn't really a whole lot he could do at, at 15 years old. And same at 16, still quite a few restrictions um, if he wanted to move up. But at least uh, there are more options now. But yeah, he's got to figure it out. And although... Uh, the last three races of the season, uh, not the smoothest for him. Uh, 13th at the Las Vegas Bull Ring, 12th at All American Speedway in Roseville, California, 14th at Phoenix. So uh, it's a pretty good thing that he had the middle stages of the season figured out, including a couple of wins at Irwindale, because uh, the last three starts, not the best. Uh, but fortunately for him, the drivers that he was racing around in the championship standings, they didn't fare that much better either, including in Phoenix, when Jake Drew finished uh, in the 11th spot. Yeah, and actually those wins that you were talking about, that's kind of what sealed the deal for his championship because when he crossed the line, it was actually a tie yep. for the championship. And what it came down to was those two wins that Love had over Drew zero wins for the season that would uh, hand him the championship. So we'll talk to Jesse Love a little bit later about his second championship, BMR's 11th consecutive championship. And Kyle, this race at Phoenix, to me, was actually a little bit reminiscent of when we used to do the Iowa east west combo race and you hate to say it but like it was always who would finish highest in the west series and most of the time they were outside of the top 10 yeah uh and there's just so many more resources on the east coast and even the west coast teams will tell you that um and, and there's a lot more opportunity for development and when you look at a Ty Gibbs and a Tanner Gray, a lot of these teams run in the, the Arkham and Art Series as well on the bigger racetracks throughout the, the, the season. So not only are they focused on their 9 to 12 East races, they also run a good chunk of, of the National Series as well, where we don't see that a whole lot from the West teams that don't have as many laps, not as many reps. And, and yeah, when a lot of these East Coast teams show up at Phoenix, uh they're they're the teams to beat and that's what we saw again this past weekend with, with uh, ty gibbs and, and tanner gray going one two yeah i'll be interested to see how the off season looks for a lot of these teams with a lot of new parts chassis bodies available to these arca teams because well we said so long to the gen six car over the weekend at nascar's upper level and most of those parts and pieces are eligible to run in the ARCA series. So uh, that just opened up a slew of new cars. Maybe we see some new teams emerge. A lot of probably work going in over the off season to expand, build new teams, or uh, maybe up some equipment. But we're going to take a quick break. When we return, we've got your 2021 ARCA West champion, Jesse Love, on the guest line. 
Whelan Engineering, a global leader in the emergency warning industry, designs and manufactures reliable and powerful warning lights. Whelan also produces white illumination lighting, sirens, controllers, and high-powered warning systems for automotive, aviation, and mass notification industries worldwide. Every part of every Whelan product is proudly designed and manufactured in America and is tested on site to meet the toughest industry certifications. Whelan Engineering, a global leader in the emergency warning industry, trusted to perform since 1950. 19- 52. Citywide to countryside, whatever you drive, wherever you go, Hercules has the value, selection, and industry-leading warranty to get you there no matter where the road takes you. Go to HerculesTires.com. There you can find the nearest authorized Hercules retail location to you. Plus, you can use the tire tracker to find out which Hercules tire fits your vehicle the best. That's HerculesTires.com. Hercules Tires. Right on our strength. Whelan Engineering, a global leader in the emergency warning industry, designs and manufactures reliable and powerful warning lights. Whelan also produces white illumination lighting, sirens, controllers, and high-powered warning systems for automotive, aviation, and mass notification industries worldwide. Every part of every Whelan product is proudly designed and manufactured in America and is tested on site to meet the toughest industry certifications. Whelan Engineering, a global leader in the emergency warning industry, trusts to perform since 1952. Welcome back to NASCAR Coast to Coast here on the Motor Racing Network. We talked about it. The ARCA West Series had a wild season finale out in Arizona for the Arizona Lottery 100, and it was 16-year-old California native Jesse Love who won his second consecutive championship. He joins us now here on Coast to Coast. Jesse, first and foremost, thanks for coming on. And has it set in that you're not just a champion, but a two-time champion back-to-back in the Arco West Series? Yeah, thanks for having me on. And, you know, I guess so. Uh, the biggest thing right now, the difference from last year, I think, um, obviously, yeah, you know, going back-to-back is, is one thing. But uh, it's just the, the season's not over yet, for me at least. So uh, I kind of touched on it in a few different interviews. Like, I'd be doing a disservice to – my super late guys, if I just kind of let it all, you know, get to me and, and kind of relax too much. So um, you can't get too complacent right now. The season's not over. We still have um, two really big super late races, uh, one this week in the Governor's Cup in New Smyrna, and then uh, it's a good tune-up for the Derby in a few weeks. So uh, those are two big races that we have to be prepared for and come at it with our best shot. So um, sorry, my camera went off. But, um, yeah, the two big races that we have to be prepared for, and I want to give, you know, our best shot to my team and, and Chris from Motorsports. Absolutely. I feel like for some teams, Hannah, the season's never really over. I feel like <laughs> it just goes 12 months a year uh, with all these uh, the, these winter races, as, as Jesse was alluding to as well, with the Derby coming up. Less hardly hard to believe it, less than a month away. Let's talk about the end of the race on Saturday afternoon, Jesse. Uh, we were confused on the Motor Racing Network. Uh, they were confused, I think, in the PA booth. A lot happens over that last lap, and it took a few minutes to sort it all out. Uh, How aware were you of the lap count and what you needed to do on that final lap? Uh, Because you made the pass that that is allowing us to talk to you right now. Yeah, I don't. I guess uh, just had to make the most of uh, the situation. We were struggling with, um, you know, being really loose all day. But the biggest thing was uh, we had just had a ground somewhere, probably about the firewall with our wiring and. Uh, it would cause the motor to shut off a few times on the straightaway each lap. So uh, we were lacking a lot of straightaway speed because of it. And uh, the motor issues were the biggest thing that plagued us throughout the day. Um, but I thought we were in the right, in the right spot. Uh, we just wanted to be right about you know, one or two spots behind the nine car. Um, and we were doing that really well throughout the whole day, um, up until at the end when it got really bad and we couldn't you know, keep up our pace. So uh, I just try to cut the dog leg as much as I could the last about five or 10 laps to get as close as I could to the nine car. Um, and, and it paid off, obviously, you know, the last about five, 10 laps or so. Uh, the motor cutoff issue would happen less and less as the run went on. So on restarts, it'd be really bad. And then, you know, as the race would go on on long runs, it would kind of uh, stop showing its head as much. So uh, the last lap was obviously uh, kind of, you know, go big or go home type of deal. I knew I had to get to him, uh, but with my closing rate, with our motor running uh, cleanly, I knew I was going to get to him either one, turns one and two or three and four. So um, just had to get to him and, and get by him uh, as quickly as possible. And at what point, you know, Kyle had mentioned the confusion uh, for pretty much everyone, honestly, on who had won it because it was a tie 
based on the points, at what point were you informed uh, that the championship was yours? Well, I knew you know, all the situations and the scenarios um, that could have taken place and where we would come out on top or miss out. Uh, and, and if we tied, we would win because we won uh, more races throughout the year than the nine car did. So I knew that I just had to stay within three spots, um, two spots, B plus one, three spots to win a tiebreaker. So uh, I knew once I got by the sixth car that I won the championship, as long as the nine didn't improve his position. Uh, and when we came off the corner uh, and took our cool down lap, I checked to make sure the nine didn't improve his position. So uh, I knew after that that we were the champion and then the ARCA official came on the radio and let us know. I, I'm glad uh, with this way the strong the way the field was strung out. I'm glad uh, you were aware because I know a lot of you guys were trying. You were coming down for the white flag. The leader was taking the checkered flag. There was a lot happening there in a in a matter of uh, thirty seconds or so. And uh, I'm glad you and your team were aware of all the different scenarios uh, that were happening. Summarize your season for me, Jesse. Uh, two wins at Irwindale Speedway. Um, bunch of top fives in the middle of the season. And then it looked like there was a little bit of a fall off there the last uh, couple races of the year. How would you describe it? Yeah, I mean, I think that we definitely had the races uh, throughout the year that didn't go our way, uh, whether it be, I think we had three mulligan races, uh, which is obviously a lot for about a nine, 10 race season. So uh, uh, we were leading at Vegas, the right front tire go flat. Um, at Sonoma, we chunked a rear gear. And then um, at All-American, we got spun out by the nine car. So, you know, again, that's why kind of I had like, you know, no remorse about the whole deal just because uh, the only reason we were in that position was because we were spun by the nine car the race before leading up to um, they, uh, Phoenix. So at the end of the day, uh, you know, being really dominant when we didn't have something go wrong uh, was why we were the champion. So it was overall um, kind of a stressful year with having, you know, those three races where we couldn't really control the outcome. It was just, you know, we couldn't control it. So. We just had to control what we could control. And um, the only races that, you know, something catastrophic didn't happen, we uh, finished first, first, second, and third. So uh, those were the races that won us a championship. And I uh, was really proud of our team to work through it and uh, get those wins when we needed to. Two championships now on your resume. Last year broke the record of the youngest champion ever. And with this consecutive one, you know, you joined Brendan Gaughan, you joined Todd Gillen, both also BMR drivers. Uh, it, it's weird to almost say when you started this journey, did you think this is imaginable? Because your journey kind of has just begun, only 16 years old. But when you kind of, you know, started this was two NASCAR championships before the age of 16 kind of on the radar? Yeah, 100%. I mean, I wasn't sure after last year whether or not uh, I was going to be running for Bill again uh, this year. Um, but, you know, Napa, you know, provided me with everything I needed to do uh, to be able to run for another championship. Uh, so, you know, obviously when I started this year, I knew that uh, we were going to be able to win the championship and the same with last year as well. So uh, I'm just happy to get the opportunity in the first place. And I think that's the biggest part. You mentioned the last uh, two races coming up for you this year uh, in, the, in these next few weeks. Then what? What's the hope for, for 2022 for you? Yeah, obviously I can't run you know, a full truck season for another two years. So Yep. Uh, next year, obviously, I trust Toyota. They've been great with me uh, to develop me throughout the last, you know, about four or five years of working with them. So um, whatever they feel is, is, you know, should be on my plate for next year will be. And, and um, obviously, I, know, I kind of know what I'm doing next year. And there'll be a lot of ARCA racing, a lot of super late racing, um, as much big track stuff as I can run. Um, but uh, whatever format it's going to be in um, and all the other details, you know, Toyota's going to announce, you know, whatever. Uh, they feel it's time and I, and I trust their decision 100 percent awesome well we look forward to it you'd mentioned the derby coming up as well as the governor's cup so your schedule still panning out for the rest of 2021 but take a moment to enjoy of course that championship uh it has been fun to watch your success and we look forward to watching it next year again congratulations jesse awesome thank you guys Again, guys, Jesse Love, your 2021 ARCA West champion. Uh, his season's not over. You can catch the Snowball Derby coming up a little bit later in the year. And, of course, that Governor's Cup at New Smyrna Speedway, or Pensacola, sorry, Pensacola, uh, a little bit later on. Going to be a busy week for a lot of racers. Uh, man, and Jesse's one of those drivers, Kyle, that he's multiverse, too. He's got his super late model, ran yep. the ARCA car. Also runs open wheel. Wouldn't be surprised if we see him at the Chili Bowl because guess what? 16 years old. He's allowed to run 
the Chili Bowl this year, finally. So uh, opening up a world of possibilities with turning 16, which is absolutely insane to think about. And, and that's, the, I guess, the good thing about motorsports these days is, one, the possibilities are out there, and two, the platforms are out there for folks to watch him race, whether it be the Chili Bowl or, or whether it be the Snowball Derby at Five Flags and in a couple of weeks' time or the Governor's Cup this weekend at New Smyrna. Um, a lot happening for him, and, and people can get to know who Jesse Love is at the tender age of 16, making a name for himself early. And like you said in the interview, he is just uh, just a few years in his what should be a long career. Absolutely. We're going to take a quick break. When we return, though, we've got your Wheel and Engineering Modified Driver Spotlight here on NASCAR Coast to Coast. Whelan Engineering, a global leader in the emergency warning industry, designs and manufactures reliable and powerful warning lights. Whelan also produces white illumination lighting, sirens, controllers, and high-powered warning systems for automotive, aviation, and mass notification industries worldwide. Every part of every Whelan product is proudly designed and manufactured in America and is tested on site to meet the toughest industry certifications. Whelan Engineering, a global leader in the emergency warning industry, trusted to perform since 1950. 52. Citywide to countryside, whatever you drive, wherever you go, Hercules has the value, selection, and industry-leading warranty to get you there no matter where the road takes you. Go to HerculesTires.com. There you can find the nearest authorized Hercules retail location to you. Plus, you can use the tire tracker to find out which Hercules tire fits your vehicle the best. That's HerculesTires.com. Hercules Tires. Ride on our strength. Whelan Engineering, a global leader in the emergency warning industry, designs and manufactures reliable and powerful warning lights. Whelan also produces white illumination lighting, sirens, controllers, and high-powered warning systems for automotive, aviation, and mass notification industries worldwide. Every part of every Whelan product is proudly designed and manufactured in America and is tested on site to meet the toughest industry certifications. Whelan Engineering, a global leader in the emergency warning industry, trust to perform since 1952. Welcome back to NASCAR Coast to Coast here on the Motor Racing Network. We talked about it. The NASCAR Wheel and Modified Tour crowned their champion this past weekend. That driver for his second consecutive and third overall championship. That is Justin Bonsignor. He joins us now on the guest line. First off, Justin, thanks for taking some time to join us here on Coast to Coast. Uh, thanks for having me on, guys. It's uh, always mean and we're doing something good. So I, I like coming on. Yeah, we talked about it a little bit before you joined us. Of course, that championship. We'll get into the whole works of that a little bit later. But I heard it in a post-race interview. I know it was on your mind going into the race. One for 41 now is now the record at Stafford Motor Speedway to end the year and the championship finally breaking through on Stafford. Uh, did that make it all the much sweeter? Yeah, it's uh, it, it's still surreal that we finally were able to get the win at Stafford and we had such a, a really good car and kind of dominated the second half of that race. So it's not like we lucked into it or or something crazy happened where we where we snuck one away and, and I would have been picked on in that front. So, um, yeah, it's nice to get that uh, that off our back and to do it on championship night. It's it's a little weird. It's it, it feels really cool. But at the same time, I've been saying it's almost like when your birthday and Christmas are on the same day and you get like two, you know, you only get one gift, you know, so only one night to enjoy it. But um, from what I remember of the night, I had a really good time. Um, it was uh, a lot of fun in the in the parking lot at the, at the campers camper lot at Stafford. And um, yeah, I'm just glad it's, it's behind us now and and we can just focus on getting the next one the next time we go to Stafford. Let's talk about the race uh, for a bit. Uh, I thought it was a pretty good race. Um, Anthony Nocella led early. The race went green forever until about 20 laps to go. But I felt like that lead group was was fairly tight, especially in the, in the second half of that 130 lap green flag run. There were issues, apparently with your pit, uh, as we heard from our pit reporter about maybe a fuel issue. I know Ryan was nervous. If, if this race goes caution free, we might be in trouble. I mean, how close was it or could it have been if there was not a caution with 20 to go yeah i mean we're always really nervous when we go to thompson and stafford and all these half mile five eighths mile tracks uh we we are cutting it close um we since we went to the spec engine years ago that's when it really started to become an issue um there has been a few guys that ran out years ago but more and more 
the more years we go past that, it seems like maybe there was another issue that night. Um, we were really conscious about saving fuel. We packed the cell. It takes us five to 10 minutes to pack the fuel cell uh, before the races just to get every drop we can in there. And um, Ryan was concerned. I did kind of slow my pace down right on a lap 100 or so. I was kind of running, you know, maybe not as deep into the corner, trying not to use as much brake, just let the car roll and roll back to the throttle. Um, once I had a fairly pretty good lead, I, I was able to do that. Um, and then, you know, I asked, I think what, just before that caution had come out, I did come over the radio and I asked, I said, do we, if they catch me, do we go into save mode for championship or do we race? And Ryan at that point was like, just, just go out and try and win the race. So, um, you know, then from there, all the cautions come out and, and you're not going to be saving at that point late in the race. So, um, it, it wasn't as close, I guess, uh, after we checked it as we thought. So that's good for the notebook for the next time we go back. Um, maybe we don't have to be as concerned, but, um, you know, I guess once the pace slows down so much on old tires, hundred plus laps into a run, you're not using as much fuel anyway. So, um, that's probably why we had more than we expected. You mentioned those cautions that came out a late race one where, uh, the man in the rear view mirror, that was Doug Kobe, of course, who the rivalry and the friendship, uh, walk hand in hand to when that final caution came out and you're on the cusp of finally breaking through at Stafford and Doug Kobe's the guy that lines up next to you. I mean, what's going through your mind? Yeah. So I knew he had a good car and he was kind of stuck there in third. And then we had, you know, the caution, the first caution comes out, we had a killer pit stop, get out, get out front, look in the mirror when we double up and, and he's sec, uh, third behind us. I'm like, ah, like, you don't know how good your car is going to fire off. It's a short run. Obviously we threw a ton of stagger at it, tried freeing the car up and just you're in qualifying mode for 20 laps. And um, we were able to drive away from him by a handful of car lengths. And I felt pretty comfortable. Then of course the green white checkered and he's next to me. And then I look in the mirror and Patrick who were battling for the championship is right behind me. And I 10 laps earlier was almost lapping him. It's like, man, these are not the two guys you want on your bumper. But um, Doug tried jumping that start pretty good. Uh, I don't know if he, tried giving it back or what, or if my car just got really good drive off of two and got into three and was able to just get by him and clear him and, and kind of had a good car that last lap to put enough distance on myself on him to where he couldn't drive into the back of me. Cause all week long, he was telling me, you know, you're going for points. I'm going to just drive through the back of you. If, uh, if you're, if you're leading and I'm second coming to the checker, cause he, he did not want me to beat him at Stafford similar to, uh, how I did not want him to get his first by being me at Riverhead. So um, big enough gap in the three where he couldn't do nothing. And, uh, you know, it was cool to celebrate. He was the first guy over to congratulate us. So as much as he talks crap, it's um, it's all in good fun. You got your first one at Stafford. He got his first win this year at Riverhead. So uh, it's kind of like it was almost uh, meant to be. Outside of a 24th place finish for you at Richmond, not a bad year. I think you averaged just a, about a 5.1. How would you kind of characterize this season and this third championship for you and your 51 team? Yeah, it was totally different than the years past. Um, you know, the first year, uh, we didn't really know what to expect when Ryan came on board. Then we go out and win eight, eight out of the 16 and, and just had an unbelievable season. When we didn't win, we finished top three or top four, um, led a ton of laps. Um, 2020 was, um, was different in itself just because of the pandemic. And we go out and have like a three point something average finish and run in the top five for the nine races we had. Um, this year we come out just as confident um, that we could do it again. Um, but just, we had the raw speed every week and we got a lot of polls, but we just weren't putting the whole races together um, to be in position to win the race. We were second, third, uh, I think half the races were first, second or third. Um, but we just, for whatever circumstances, didn't get out of the pits first, had a little slow pit stop, uh, got a bad lane on a restart. You just, we didn't always have the racing luck that you need that in 2018, just basically was handed to us um and it, it makes it a little frustrating you're like wow we only had one win until this point and our cars are that good but you just have to remain focused and stay stay confident that you know when you're running top three each and every week you're gonna at some point knock the door down and, and win another race so um you know considering uh how the year went and only having a one win i'll take the stafford win as it kind of counts as maybe a few extra in my eyes so um I, i'll count it as five wins as, as far as i'm concerned <laughs> Taking a look at the whole modified field when it came down to the championship, Kyle and I talked about it throughout the year. Uh, you know, this was probably one of the first times in the last couple of years that we've seen a championship potentially go down to the last weekend. You know, you clinched pretty early on in one of your championships, uh, or it looked like usually someone was starting to walk away with, with a few races to go. What kind of set this year apart in comparison to previous years 
with uh, allowing different winners, seeing that we saw, you know, Emerling get win. We saw uh, Eric Goodale get wins that we usually maybe don't see. What set this season apart? Oh, that's a good question. I mean, I just think, honestly, the competition is so close. It might not always show that because it does seem like the same guys are repetitive winners, but um, you know, we're within a couple tenths, so two to three tenths, this whole field is, um, and, you know, like at Martinsville, uh, Eric just made the right adjustments at the last pit stop and had a really good car and made it, you know, the best car. And we went maybe a little bit the other way and same thing happened at a lot of races. Um, you know, Ryan came in priest, won a handful of races. He was probably the best car, I think on a, on a, on the races that he was there. So, um, Patrick was, you know, made a huge leap in their program this year and was competitive and ran top three every week. Uh, Hirschman, when he shows up, there's just so many guys when they show up, if they don't run the whole schedule can always win. Um, but it just, you know, it's, it's deceiving. Cause like you said, uh, you know, the same four or five guys seem to always win the races, but there's 10 or 12 that if circumstances play out in the right way, they can win races. So, um, that's what makes the tour fun and makes it so competitive. I mean, everybody has the same basic race cars nowadays. We all run spec engines. We run the same tire, same fuel. Uh, the box that we race in is really small and really tight. And that's what makes um, for the hard nose and close racing that you see. Did it feel different that Doug wasn't one of the drivers that you were running for the, the championship going into the final race? I think he said in post-race, it was the first time in, and I think, 10 years that he didn't go into the last race. Uh, as a title contender only because he, you know, he missed that race earlier this year due to SRX. Yeah. But I quickly reminded him that in 2018, he was like a hundred points behind. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, he, you know, for the last 10 plus years, he has been uh, in contention uh, whether he won or lost just by a little bit. Um, it, it is probably different. Um, but at the same time, up until he got crashed at Riverhead last week, he was in the owner's points in contention and we were, genuinely concerned like you know we don't want him to sneak in here and, and pull this off and have to share the share the spotlight with him so um yeah it was it was definitely different but um you know it's still still the same old deal you know we've we've done this uh from both sides we've we've lost a handful before we ever won our first in close battles and then we we learned how to win one and then that one was you know pretty not to be cocky but that one was pretty easy points racing wise that year we had a fairly good gap and 2020 was um we had a decent gap and then this year we we were close all year long patrick had one hiccup and that kind of you know gave us that big buffer and then we both had hiccups at, at richmond and uh we, we were just kind of at a point where we had enough to breathe but still was a little nervous if we had another mechanical failure or get caught up in a crash that could all be wiped away quickly so um i appreciate each different way that you can compete and contend for these championships because now next year if it's 10, 12 points again, you're going to be confident in yourself knowing, hey, we did this once, you know, don't stress on it all week. Don't don't pull your hair off for no reason. You're going to just do what you can and, and see what happens. That being said, looking forward, uh, what's next on your goal of things? You've got three championships. You finally checked old Stafford Motor Speedway off the list. Uh, what's next on your, you know, personal goals as a driver? Well, I mean, as much as we've accomplished and the success that we've had these last few years, um, you know, Doug is still has twice as many championships as us. So the <laughs> ultimate goal will be to each year go and try and, you know, our, our next goal is immediately to try and get the fourth um, and then keep going from there. But obviously it's not that simple. Um, all we can ask for each and every year is it's just a, a shot to contend for the championship. And if when you get to the last race, you have it, you just, you know, make try and make the most of it. So, um, I mean, I'm only 33. I, I, you know, it's old in some ways, but I feel like I still have a decent amount of years. I got a really good team behind me that, you know, every text message so far this week from them is they want to go out and do this again next year and the year after that. And uh, if we could keep this group together for a while, I think the sky's the limit. So, um, you know, we have some guys, I think, within reach on the uh, win list. You know, if we could maybe get to second all time at some point um, before it's all said and done would be really cool. I, I'd like to think Mike's um, Mike's record is probably way out of reach. Um, you know, if you won eight every year, it'd be easy. But, uh, you know, this year you only get two. So um, the, the immediate goal will be to try and contend for the fourth and then we'll just take it year by year from there if, if we're fortunate enough to ever get the fourth. Well, uh, while we got you, let's look ahead to 2022 and we anticipate uh, the season. Well, it's been announced, but the next new track on the series is going to be New Smyrna Speedway. Your thoughts about going down there and uh, what appears to be opening up the schedule down in Florida next uh, next spring? Yeah, it's, um, that was a huge announcement. We got that news um, 
while in Richmond that morning, and we were just uh, totally shocked by that. It's been rumors for years, and we've always wanted it. I mean, I've, I've run Smyrna. I've done Speed Weeks a uh, handful of times. I haven't done it recently, but um, we're excited. Um, you know, the Daytona Speed Weeks leading up to the 500 is the pinnacle of, of racing. You know, everybody goes to Florida during that time, whether it's asphalt, dirt, the National Series, like that is where you want to be. Um, and for us to kick our season off there should be should be really good. Um, I'm hoping that we can pull in some of the guys that run the open weeks, uh, open events there for that week. I think it sounds like we're going to stay and use that week to do some testing because there's been some some rule changes in our series that we uh, kind of held back on trying new ideas this year because we were in the points. We didn't want to mess mess ourselves up. So I think we're going to spend that week trying some things. And, you know, if if you go down there and the weather's 80 degrees each and every day and you're out of the snow, what else could you ask for? So, um, you know, just hope for the best on all those fronts. And I think it should be a really good event. Um, not sure if the ARCA is going to be there as well. So uh, it could be, you know, really good speed weeks. It should work out really well for New Smyrna in general. And, uh, you know, they've always been huge supporters of, of modified racing and for them to finally take the leap to, to have the tour come in and pay that the purse that they have to pay is, is really cool. And, um, you know, we're hoping to put on a good event for them and, um, you know, it'll be here before you know it. We have some other racing to do still, but February uh, is going to come quick and it's a quick turnaround compared to, you know, late March or early April for, for our normal uh, winters. I'll trade you. I'll take the snow and you can come have the North Carolina winters. <laughs> no, thanks. I'll, I'll trade you for sure. I hate it. <laughs> awesome. Well, Justin, of course, congratulations once again on the championship. We're looking forward to uh, watching you next year, try and chase uh, yet another championship. And of course, the racing that you have planned over the off season. No, I thank you guys for uh, having me on. I'll hopefully see you all soon and um, have a good uh, holiday season if I don't talk to you. Whelan Engineering, a global leader in the emergency warning industry, designs and manufactures reliable and powerful warning lights. Whelan also produces white illumination lighting, sirens, controllers, and high-powered warning systems for automotive, aviation, and mass notification industries worldwide. Every part of every Whelan product is proudly designed and manufactured in America and is tested on site to meet the toughest industry certifications. Whelan Engineering, a global leader in the emergency warning industry, trusted to perform since 19. 52. Citywide to countryside, whatever you drive, wherever you go, Hercules has the value, selection, and industry-leading warranty to get you there no matter where the road takes you. Go to HerculesTires.com. There you can find the nearest authorized Hercules retail location to you. Plus, you can use the tire tracker to find out which Hercules tire fits your vehicle the best. That's HerculesTires.com. Hercules Tires. Ride on our strength. Whelan Engineering, a global leader in the emergency warning industry, designs and manufactures reliable and powerful warning lights. Whelan also produces white illumination lighting, sirens, controllers, and high-powered warning systems for automotive, aviation, and mass notification industries worldwide. Every part of every Whelan product is proudly designed and manufactured in America and is tested on site to meet the toughest industry certifications. Whelan Engineering, a global leader in the emergency warning industry, trusted to perform since 1952. Welcome back to NASCAR Coast to Coast here on the Motor Racing Network. The schedules are finally being announced because, well, Kyle, the racing has come down to a close. We talked about it with Jesse Love. Uh, big race season kind of amidst us. We've got some big key marker races that are kind of going to finish out the year. And then there are just some racetracks like New Smyrna and Pensacola that their season's don't stop with the red eye. You know, you've got Turkey Derby up north uh, and we'll get into those a little bit later. But that 2022 mod schedule, we got a, a sneak peek of it a couple weeks ago. Yep. The full thing finally announced a 16 race schedule. 13 of those dates, though, are confirmed starting February 12th at New Smyrna, ending October 27th at Martinsville. Definitely a change up for the modified schedule. Oh, change up in the last couple of decades. I think the Modifieds a long time ago, going back to the mid 80s, uh, ended their season at the Martinsville Speedway with uh, Dogwood 500 or the Cardinal 500. One of those events, the ball running of the event, I think was the championship race until Thompson became uh, a championship event. But uh, gonna, I'm going to be excited. Uh, exciting, that is, for Martinsville will be at the end of the season. Uh, Riverhead Raceway uh, holding three events next year, May 14th, June 25th, and September 17th. 
Tours going back to the Richmond Raceway for a second consecutive year on April 1st. New Hampshire Motor Speedway is back on the, the schedule with a single event on July 16th. Uh, just some of the, the races on the schedule for next season. 13 announced as of right now. Yeah, there's three TBAs, including one in July, one in August, and one in September. So definitely some wheels in motion. And interesting also, of course, we you know talk about big key marker uh modified races, the spring sizzler in a conflict race with uh, Langley. So interesting to see how that may pan out more modified news though. Craig Lutz to drive for Danny Watts in 2022 usually runs for Goody racing Eric Goodale, that family. Um, they actually shut down mid 2021, kind of leaving Lutz without a ride, which we followed and uh, Lutz to take over the ride over at Danny Watts and Anthony Nacella parting ways that'll start this weekend Kyle uh going into the Islip 300 at Riverhead a well, fifth annual Islip 300 and what an entry list it uh it is shaping up to be this weekend uh Ryan Priest the defending winner of the event he of course is running the race as is this year's modified track champion Kyle Soper you got Timmy Salamito Patrick Emerling Justin Bonsignor Mike Christopher Jr Keith Rocco Kyle Bonsignor you can go on uh, Jimmy Blewett John McKennedy it's going to be a who's who of modified racing this uh, this weekend, a single day show on Saturday, 30 cars on the entry list. Um, Kyle Soper, he'll be presented with the Eddie Partridge uh, Modified Championship Drivers Cup prior to the event as this year's track, track champion. Of course, Partridge, the co-owner of the racetrack, we lost him following uh, the Richmond race for the Modified Tour just a couple of months ago due to a, a medical event. So uh, going to be an emotional day. Going to be a fun way to wrap up the modified season at Riverhead on Long Island this Saturday. And did I also see that, you know, of course you said brings out the best of the best, Matt Hirschman. Uh, I think maybe yeah. he's debating on going. Did I see Dave Sapienza? Yeah, a couple up thousand a, like, dollars. Big, big bonus if Matt Hirschman can show up at the Islip 300 and, and win. win the 300. So uh, you got to love the modified crew. You know what I mean? They're all, they're all about jabbing each other, but also, man, they will have each other's back when it comes down to it. Hickory Motor Speedway though also has kind of been making some waves when it comes to the world of short track racing because, and, and, and this is just personal opinion. We often see the let's take short track racing formats and take it to the top level of NASCAR. Well, Hickory did the opposite. They're actually going to implement a NASCAR style playoff format into their weekly division uh, normally a 21-ish race regular season for them. Now yep. going to be an 18 race season with 13 of those being a regular season, four races being a playoff. Drivers have to compete in eight of the 13 to qualify. The regular season champion will get a thousand dollar bonus. Interesting to see it. I and and I personally took to Twitter, Kyle, just to kind of gauge short trackers. Like, how is everyone reacting? And surprisingly, so it was a very positive reaction because drivers right now or tracks are having a hard time getting teams to commit to points racing and this is a great way to get uh, teams and drivers in a situation where they can commit to a full season and have that shot at a championship exactly and we saw it this year with uh, josh kosick the champion in the late models missed four events and still was the the hickory late model track champion so this is a way to allow more teams to uh, either spend time with the family, uh, as it said in their press release, or like you mentioned, there's a lot more tours out there and a lot more options for these teams to go partake in. We see it up here in the Northeast in modified racing. We see it down in the South in, in late model and super late model racing. So if you have to miss a race or two or three at Hickory to go run, say a cars tour race or something, you can do that and, and not have to worry about being out of the championship picture at Hickory. Yeah, definitely going to be interesting to see if uh, other tracks, maybe, maybe not into 2021, but eventually adopt this, uh, you know, this notion and, and to see NASCAR even grab a hold of short track racing format for the clash. You and I talked about this yesterday, heat races, single car qualifying, LCQs, uh, things obviously as short trackers that we love to see implemented. A lot of stuff planning on going on during the 2021 off season going into next year still some schedules that need to be announced of course the mexico series they don't wrap up their season until december 5th and 6th uh so you'll have to catch their champion via their social media pages or on the nascar roots homepage. kyle this all started in 2012 when you interviewed a 15 year old hannah after a late model win what were and we ever thinking since 2018 you've been stuck with me and, and then we just four years 
And apparently this is it for Hannah Newhouse and the Hannah and Kyle show or the Hannah Newhouse show, I guess is what it was done. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Uh, congratulations on your 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 new opportunity. Uh, I saw you debut on camera just a couple of nights ago at the Charlotte Motor Speedway dirt track, and uh, you will be missed here on NASCAR Coast to Coast. Yeah, it just won't be the same. The Hannah Newhouse show can't be the same without Kyle or without Hannah Newhouse and Kyle Ricky, of course. But no, it's been fun, of course, getting to know all of the short trackers. I'm not leaving short track racing. Uh, I'll still be amidst the short track racing world, but just on the dirt side. Um, as of course I joined world racing group, the world of outlaw late models, uh, going to be a busy year next year, over 55 races is what I'm currently slated for. So, God bless you. Yep. Kyle, you'll have to make your way up to a world of outlaws race. I know you'll be busy next year as well, but, uh, it's been, it's been one heck of a run for four years. You know what I mean? But I appreciate it. And everyone that's come on NASCAR coast to coast and, and, and so much more to look forward to in the upcoming years. It's been fun to work with you, Hannah. Uh, and hopefully this isn't the last time. <laughs> I, I highly doubt it, Kyle. You just can't seem to get rid of me. Even when y'all was a guest, I came back as a co-host. I don't know what to tell you. But again, we want to thank all of our guests over this year, the 2021 season between racetrack promoters, series promoters, drivers. It's been one heck of a season, especially coming off of 2020. Uh, we want to thank all of them. And of course, Wheel and Engineering, Hercules Tires for being partners here at NASCAR Coast to Coast. That concludes us for the 2021 season. Everyone enjoy their off season. Happy holidays and uh Well, I won't see you next year, but uh, we appreciate everyone for tuning in here on the Motor Racing Network. For myself, Hannah Newhouse, Kyle Rickey, and Craig Moore, enjoy your awesome.